Nobody else grabs you, twists you, turns you, hurls you, shakes you, shoots you, rocks you, loves you, and puts you right in the middle of all the action and adventure you've seen on the screen. Not anyone. If you want to go on the greatest rides based on the biggest movies, there's only one place you can. You've got to go to Orlando and go to Universal Studios Florida, the number one movie studio and theme park in the world. Universal Studios Florida, the only place on earth where you can ride the movies. In spring of 2021, Universal Orlando moved its main merchandise store in CityWalk to a new and larger location. This new store follows the trend of other theme park retail, sitting in a generic space that can be slightly rethemed when new seasonal merchandise drops. However, Universal decided to leave the store's former location intact, slightly retheming it instead to the Universal Legacy store. Walking in, this retail space acts not just as an opportunity to sell more retro merchandise, but also works as a celebration of the history of the resort. The content of the store itself is fascinating, using models and props to represent both current and past attractions. However, it is also a reminder of how different Universal Studios Florida was when it first opened in 1990. It reminds me of how Epcot Center, when it opened in 1982, was a completely different park from what we know today. Featuring many classic but extinct attractions, that park has devolved from what it once was and has essentially become unrecognizable in its front half. In the same vein as this, Universal Studios Florida as we now know it is completely unrecognizable from the park it once was. Today when we walk in, we'll find an abundance of screen-based experiences and a handful of decent rides and shows. However, the park has essentially changed so much that through its long history of demolishing attractions and replacing them, it has transformed into something completely different. The one single experience that still remains is the E.T. Adventure, a classic reminder of what the park once used to be. As Universal continues to explode in popularity, especially with their new park on the way, I think it's time to tell the story of the classic park that Universal essentially demolished. I would like to take a look back at the incredibly advanced and creative attractions that defines that park, reminiscing and reflecting on what we're missing today. Why were such impressive attractions like Jaws or Confrontation replaced? Their ambitious scope hasn't really been matched since, and I think it's important to highlight what Universal once was exploring the reasons for why this park has been torn down and reinvented. With that being said, join me today as we ride the movies back in time to classic Universal Studios Florida. Carl Lemley immigrated to the United States and settled in Chicago in 1884. As a young immigrant from Germany, Lemley relied on working miscellaneous jobs and taking loans from his older brother, who had settled in the United States 12 years prior. However, after about 10 years of trying his hand in different professions and having become fluent in English, Lemley spotted an opportunity and took the job of bookkeeper for the Continental Clothing Company, a retail chain located in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. While essentially an accountant, the job allowed him to try his hand at advertising, and having been successful in helping to create a strong brand for the company, eventually found himself in a cozy management position. Intending to use his saved money to start his own retail chain, he one day observed the popularity of a Nickelodeon, and realized that the new moving pictures industry could be quite lucrative. Just a quick note for those who don't know, Nickelodeons were the first movie theaters, showing short films for the cost of a nickel. The name is derived from the 5 cent admission price, in conjunction with the Greek word odeon, essentially meaning a theater with a roof. In 1906, Limley quickly moved to open his own Nickelodeon, The White Front, on Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. 
He then quickly opened a second, called the Family Theater. Because the film distribution process was, to put it lightly, inconsistent and messy in the early days of the industry, Lemley also opened his own film exchange in the same year. This allowed him to secure higher quality and more entertaining films without fear of them being poached by other theaters, in addition to opening up better communication channels with the producers. Of course, his services extended to other theaters as well, and by 1908, Lemley Film Service had offices across the United States, becoming the largest film distributor in the country. His success undoubtedly came from jumping on the opportunity of a rising industry, but his advertising and marketing experience played a large role in this as well. By offering a square deal in contrast to the shady practices of other film exchanges, Lemley's business gained a strong and trustworthy reputation. In 1912, Lemley and a number of other independent film producers would found Universal Pictures, and Lemley would later become sole owner in 1915. As film production ramped up, he realized that he would need to expand, and moved the entire production unit first from Chicago to New York, and then shortly from there to California. With land being cheap, and with a desirable climate, Lemley settled Universal Pictures in San Fernando Valley on a former chicken farm, and incorporated the studio into a city known as Universal City. From the start, Lemley believed in advertising as directly as possible, opening up the studio to tours from the public. People could pay an admission fee of 25 cents to receive a boxed lunch, and to watch as movies were being filmed. However, as the era of the silent film came to an end, so too did the studio tours. Crowds of tourists would generate far too much noise to produce films with them nearby, and so the studio would close its gates to the public around 1930, as films with sound would become the norm. For 30 years, the studio would remain closed to the public until 1961. With the rising popularity of television, studios in Hollywood had to find more creative ways to make money among diminishing returns on their films. Noticing the popularity of guided bus tours in Hollywood, Universal would outsource to the Grey Line Bus Company, where tourists would be treated to a script provided by the studio, highlighting the functionality of the campus and promoting new films. As part of the program, tourists would be dropped off at the commissary to help boost food sales at the struggling studio. However, Universal would really open the studio back up in 1964 with the introduction of the Glamour Trams. For a fee of $2.50, visitors would tour the studio back lot on the trams and be entertained through a number of different demonstrations. This would include an exhibition of various movie costumes, a dressing room walkthrough, a movie makeup demonstration, and a small western shootout stunt show. As the tram tour continued to gain in popularity over the years, major additions would be added. Three major staples of the tour would premiere under the direction of Barry Upson, leading the earliest team for Universal Creative. The first of these was the Flash Flood, introduced in 1968. The tram would drive into a Mexican town, where the guide would make a demonstration of different rain and thunderstorm effects. Pretending that the effects went out of control, the scene is triggered, allowing water to rush down towards the tram and destroying the town. Another of these effects is the parting of the Red Sea, debuting in 1973 and draining part of Park Lake, allowing the tram to move down through it. The following year, the collapsing bridge would be added, which seems pretty self-explanatory. Various scenes would come and go over the years, but the first sign of life for Universal Studios Florida would premiere in 1976. Following the popularity of Steven Spielberg's Jaws just a year prior, the tram tour would incorporate the Jaws experience, bringing guests up close with the rampaging Great White Shark from the film. In 1986, an even more ambitious scene would have the trams exit New York Street and drive into a soundstage. Here they would witness the destruction of New York City, as the tram drove right up to the impressively sized King Kong animated figure. Hanging onto the bridge, Kong would shake it violently, and guests could smell bananas on his breath as he roared at the tram. One last significant addition to the tram tour would be in 1988, 
with the inclusion of Earthquake. In this particular scene, based on the 1974 film, the trams will drive into an underground metro station, which would suddenly be rocked by an earthquake measuring 8.3 on the Richter scale. From there, guests would witness the chaos that would ensue. The tram tour was the main attraction for the studio, but as it evolved, other shows and attractions would be added to the lot as well, slowly evolving it into a full theme park based around movie production. However, as it began to take shape, an idea for an East Coast studio and theme park located in Orlando, Florida would start to be conceptualized. In 1981, Universal's parent company at the time, MCA, sent president of their recreation services to meet with executives at Paramount to propose a possible joint venture in building the park. Among the Paramount executives was the president, Michael Eisner. It appears that no progress was made in that meeting, as Paramount never committed to the project, but as many watching this know, Eisner would later be offered the position of CEO at Disney and would take the role in 1984. In the following year, Eisner would announce that Disney would be building their own studio park at Walt Disney World in conjunction with MGM, known as Disney MGM Studios. Including an alleged similar layout to the Universal plans in both tram and walking tours, MCA executives were furious to discover that Eisner had essentially stolen their park plans in an effort to snuff them out. However, as they had no partners to go forward on the project with, the wind had been taken out of the sails for the new Florida park. This would change when the Kong scene on the tram tour would premiere, showing MCA and Universal that a theme park was a viable competitor to Disney if done on a more ambitious scale. The Kong animatronic was also worked on by Peter Alexander, a former Disney Imagineer and college roommate of Steven Spielberg. Having invited Spielberg to the soundstage during the testing phase and having been impressed, Spielberg asked him to develop a new attraction based around Back to the Future. The story goes that as George Lucas had just finished with the development of Star Tours at Disneyland in 1987, he had teased Spielberg that Universal could never create anything like it. In an effort to prove him wrong, and seeing the technical capabilities of Kong, Spielberg not only helped develop Back to the Future as a major attraction, but signed on as a creative for Universal, giving them new confidence in going forward with the Florida Park. While Universal Studios Florida would still be utilized as a working movie studio, also including a tram tour and bringing over various shows from the Hollywood Park, it would also shoot for something more ambitious. It would take certain segments from the Hollywood tram tour like Kong, Earthquake, and Jaws, turning them into exciting and bombastic full-blown attractions. Running full speed ahead, MCA would partner with Cineplex Odeon Corporation to fund and announce the project in December of 1986. After three years of construction, Universal Studios Florida would open in 1990, just one year after the premiere of Disney MGM Studios. Just a quick favor, but the time, effort, and research that goes into these videos can be pretty extensive. If you enjoy these video essays, you can help the channel out by leaving a like on the video or sharing it around with people who never really got to experience this early park. I also recommend subscribing if you like this kind of stuff. It's difficult to know where to start when covering this park, so I think that we should begin with the main entrance, working our way clockwise and discussing each attraction as we move through. When we make our way to Universal Studios Florida today, we first have to travel through the shopping and dining district of Universal City Walk before making a right and passing the Universal Globe before entering the iconic archways of the park. However, in the early days, CityWalk didn't exist, and visitors would park in a lot directly in front of the entrance. Before you entered the park, a different but still iconic globe would greet you, and the main entrance was flanked by gargoyles, which you can see up close at the Universal Legacy Store today. As you move into the park, the first area that guests would find themselves in was Production Central. In this area, guests could see sound stages that hosted various in-park shows, but could also see others that were really used for film and television production. Making a left, guests would find themselves at Nickelodeon Studios on the outskirts of the park, which really did act as a working studio for the Nickelodeon television channel. I'll cover that a little bit later, but I would first like to cover the production tram tour, which was a short-lived attraction that opened with the park and only ran until 1995. 
To experience this attraction, guests would board the tram right next to Nickelodeon Studios, and it would take them backstage alongside the working sound stages. The guide on the tram would highlight films and television shows that had been filmed there, before then circling back to the park and entering an area known as the Boneyard. Here, discarded movie props from famous films were on display. To give you a sense of bearing, the Boneyard was located where the Music Plaza stage is located today. From here, the tram would then enter either the New York or Hollywood sections of the park, changing the route depending on if there was any active filming going on. It was more likely that the tram would enter New York first, with the guide pointing out various attractions and listing out films that had utilized this area of the park for a movie set. I'm sure you've also noticed that the tram just makes its way through crowds of parkgoers, which I was surprised to find out about as well. Moving along, the tram passes a soundstage that hosted various shows, it makes a right into Hollywood, where the tram guide continues to list film productions that use the various facades. Exiting Hollywood, the tram moves back through Production Central, and drops the riders back off in front of Nickelodeon Studios. I think it's obvious why the tram tour didn't stick around, as it lacked the depth of the Hollywood version, spending the majority of its time trying to interrupt people walking around the park. While early Universal Studios Florida did also have its fair share of film and television production though, the tram tour didn't really show you anything interesting other than the gray walls of the sound stages, making for what appears to be an underwhelming experience. Still, despite having some production going on, the park never really became the movie-making center on the East Coast that it wanted to be, an issue that Disney MGM Studios encountered as well. In fact, the majority of production from Universal's Florida Park came from Nickelodeon Studios, which was allowed to move in rent-free in exchange for public tours and promotion of the park on their channel. Out front, visitors would encounter the iconic Slime Geyser. Having been added a few months after the park had opened, it would shoot out water that had been dyed green. Guests to the studio would embark on a 45-minute walking tour, first taking Nickelodeon-themed escalators up to the second floor. From there, the tour would take them to see various production elements like a central control room, it would also go through viewing areas where Nickelodeon game show sets on sound stages could be viewed. Walking downstairs, guests would see the wardrobe department and Gak Kitchen, where one lucky kid would be able to consume some signature Nickelodeon slime. Finally, the tour would end in an audition room where kids could audition to participate in the shows being filmed, though as far as I can tell, this was oftentimes more for show rather than an actual audition. That being said, because Universal promised guests that they would be able to view a live production pretty much whenever they visited, and because that obviously wasn't the case, the audition room was later changed to a false game show titled Game Lab, where kids from the tour would participate and one of them would be slimed at the conclusion. Nickelodeon Studios, while popular in the first half of the 90s, would continue to decline in production due to corporate changes at the company, opting instead to move filming to sound stages located in California over the years. With this came the rise in popularity of Nickelodeon's animated series, turning away from game shows and effectively becoming the focus of the network. In 2001, with essentially no filming going on at this point, the Nickelodeon Studio Tour was shortened to a 10 minute walkthrough downstairs, with guests participating in an abbreviated version of Game Lab. The tour could not continue limping on though, and despite some half-hearted attempts at reviving it, like giving the facade a new paint job, the final tour would be held on April 30th, 2005. Going through some minor construction and a new paint job, the former Nickelodeon Studios would be removed from the park, now converted into a theater hosting Blue Man Group, and opening as part of Universal CityWalk in 2007. From this point forward, the show would run until the shutdown of 2020, and now has been permanently removed. While we have yet to get to the more exciting attractions found further in the park, Production Central did host a number of different experiences and shows that I find interesting. If we start again from the front of the park and move past the street that leads to Nickelodeon Studios and the production tram tour, we will first encounter the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera on the left, which was a simulator attraction that would take visitors into the iconic cartoons of the Hanna-Barbera production company. After waiting through the outside portion of the queue, Visitors would enter a pre-show room where Yogi Bear would approach the guests, asking them for food. 
Boo Boo then shows up and tells him to stop pestering people, announcing that everyone is here for an animation demonstration. Yogi replies that he's happy to do it, but he doesn't actually know how the process works. Boo Boo says he doesn't know either, but that's probably why the big bosses, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, are here. Viewers then turn to a different screen where Hannah and Barbera are addressing Scooby-Doo, Fred Flintstone, Barney Rubble, and George and Jane Jetson, directing them to stage 14 for a new production. As they leave, Hannah and Barbera start to talk a little bit about the animation process, and the many iconic characters that they've drawn over the years, including the villain Dick Dastardly. Barbera then starts to demonstrate by drawing Elroy Jetson, who comes to life as he's being drawn. Hannah then speaks about how computers are changing the animation industry, as the computer draws Dastardly's spaceship. Once finished, Dastardly and his sidekick Muttley rise out of the cockpit, where Dastardly gloats about how deliciously evil he is, and how he should star in the next Hanna-Barbera cartoon. However, he's told that Elroy would be next, and in his anger, he states that if he can't be the star, no one will be. Muttley then shoots a plunger at Elroy, reeling him into the ship and kidnapping him as they escape into the computer, causing it to start to malfunction and transform into a black hole. Yogi and Boo Boo then ask the guests to quickly hurry through the opening doors and board the rockets where they'll give chase to Dastardly to get Elroy back. Try it now, Yogi. Okay, folks. Hold on. Once seated, the ride sequence starts, where the simulator vehicles lift up in conjunction with the action on the screen. Boo Boo asks how the rockets are powered, and Yogi replies that they're just going to be using a big rubber band, right as the guests are slingshotted through Portal to Bedrock. Catching up to Dastardly and Muttley, the rockets chase them through the canyons of Mr. Slate's construction site, before then encountering Fred Flintstone and entering the town. Throughout the chase, a series of gags play out, before then launching back into the sky and chasing Dastardly through another portal. Entering a graveyard, the rockets encounter Shaggy and Scooby in the Mystery Machine, and then veer off to follow Dastardly into a haunted castle. Here, the riders encounter Shaggy and Scooby again, as well as some ghosts, before then crashing through a wall and entering another portal to continue the chase. Finally, the rockets end up in Orbit City, flying through buildings and dodging flying cars. Eventually, the Jetsons join the chase, which continues into a floating theme park. The rockets follow dastardly onto a roller coaster track, where the Jetsons attempt to recover Elroy and eventually succeed in doing so. Dastardly and Muttley then crash into a building, destroying their rocket, and are then picked up by the police. The Jetsons thank the riders, and the rocket now flies back to the launch station and approaches for a crash landing. At the end of the runway, a large balloon stops the momentum, throwing Yogi out of the vehicle, thanking them for joining him on the ride. Ah, uh, yeah, I meant to do that. So folks, thanks for joining in the ride. As guests exit the attraction, they would enter an area where kids could meet with many of the iconic characters and could then play with a number of interactive exhibits. The Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera opens with the park in 1990 and would continue running until 2002. In 2003, it would retain the same ride system but would incorporate a new film and open as Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast, working as a spiritual successor by having guests board rockets and following Jimmy Neutron through various Nickelodeon cartoons. Finally, this attraction would close in 2011, reopening again as Despicable Me, Minion Mayhem in 2012, still using the same ride system in the building today. Across the street from Hanna-Barbera was Alfred Hitchcock, The Art of Making Movies, a show that highlighted filmmaking through the lens of the iconic director. Guests would first enter the building and see movie posters and props from some of Hitchcock's more famous films. From there, they would enter a pre-show room where guests were handed 3D glasses. Soon, a film would start, introduced by Hitchcock using archive footage of him, and displaying iconic scenes from his most popular films. 
Suddenly, the screen would seem to tear apart, where crows would appear with a 3D effect, attacking the audience and lifted from the film The Birds. Once this portion concludes, guests are then moved into a theater for the main portion of the show. Inside the theater was a small recreation of the Bates Motel from Psycho in a video would play, hosted by Anthony Perkins, the actor who played the murderous Norman Bates in the film. He would explain how innovative the film was for the time, using different camera angles and movements to convey the action of the knife to convincingly film the murder in the iconic shower scene. A stage in front of the audience would contain a set recreating that particular scene, and the show director would pick out an audience member to portray Norman Bates. From here, a recreation of the scene would play out, where an actress in a skin-colored bodysuit would be murdered by Bates, and the footage would be spliced into other pre-filmed shots to create a full scene. At the conclusion of this segment, Perkins would reappear and provide information on how the scene was shot in the original film. Once the video ends, the scene is recreated again, but this time from a different angle, putting a black screen over the face of the volunteer to help illustrate how certain shots from the film were executed. Finally, Perkins appears one last time to present the original scene as shot for the film. Interrupted by a flash of lightning, the director is then chased by the guests dressed as Norman Bates, who then turns and stalks members of the audience. He then approaches the shower set to find the hiding show director, pulling the curtain back and revealing that the original volunteer is still in the same place. He then pulls off the mask to reveal that he's one of the stage crew, illustrating the concept of the plot twist that Hitchcock helped popularize as a method for storytelling in film. Once the show ends, viewers funnel into a post-show area where a number of different demonstrations from Hitchcock's films can be viewed. The first of these is from Saboteur, where guests from the crowd can be chosen to simulate falling off of the Statue of Liberty. Another segment had volunteers reenacting the out-of-control carousel fight scene from Strangers on a Train. Last, visitors could grab a pair of binoculars and look out into a building set based on the film Rear Window. They would look out into the various scenes, attempting to spot a murderer before he spotted them. The post-show area was also full of educational material, in addition to showing iconic clips of Hitchcock's films. While Alfred Hitchcock, the art of making movies, isn't as well known as the more ambitious attractions that defined the early park, it still played a significant thematic role in that it went behind the scenes and showed visitors how certain aspects of filmmaking were pulled off. I also admire how it aimed to be educational, trying to highlight why Hitchcock was such an innovative director and how the methods he used in his films helped change the industry. The attraction would close in January 2003, gutting the stages and reopening the same year in May as the theater show Shrek 4D, which would survive until its permanent closure in January of 2022. Production Central would stretch down to the park's lagoon, with the building located there hosting an attraction based on the popular show Murder, She Wrote. Known as the Murder, She Wrote Mystery Theater, the show inside would showcase different facets of producing a television episode. The first room would have guests watch a short film hosted by Angela Lansbury, the actress who played the main character of Jessica Fletcher for the show. Here, she congratulates the visitors on becoming executive producers and lists out the roles that they'll play through the post-production process. The next room has everyone travel into a studio, where a host covers how important editing can be to a final product. She plays a clip of a surprise Lansbury, substituting in different shots like a firearm or a kissing couple to demonstrate how powerful editing can be in recontextualizing a scene. A small clip then plays from a faux episode, in which Lansbury states that the killer forgot to clean the flower off of his shoes. The actress playing the editor cheekily states that the director forgot about this one too. To remedy this issue, the editor demonstrates how computers can be used to add in effects, like the flower on the shoes, to help fix mistakes in the editing process. Next, the show moves towards a sound effect or Foley stage, named after Universal's own Jack Foley, who helped pioneer how many sound effects were created for films. Here, a new host demonstrates how sound effects are produced for television by bringing up some volunteers. One comical example is having a kid roar into a microphone before playing it over a clip of animatronic Kong. Later, 
various volunteers were chosen to help fill out the sound effects for an episode of Murder, She Wrote. From here, the show would move into a final theater, where its host would cover what happens with unclear dialogue. Here, volunteers are picked out to provide an auto-dialogue replacement, which are segments of dialogue recorded by actors in post-production. The volunteers are then given lines to read, which are finally edited together into the final product for the episode. Like the art of making movies, I appreciate how the Murder, She Wrote Mystery Theater focused on production, but this time with television. While not a particularly exciting show, it was entertaining and educational for the viewers. Having opened in 1990 with the park, the attraction would close with the cancellation of the show in 1996, being replaced in 1997 with Hercules and Xena, Wizards of the Screen. This attraction will be based on two popular television shows, Hercules The Legendary Journeys and Xena Warrior Princess. The actual attraction itself would work a lot like Murder, She Wrote, bringing guests to various theaters where different elements of television production would be demonstrated, also including audience participation as well. I can't really cover the show in any depth because information and video on it is pretty scarce, but despite not being an opening day attraction, I still very much consider it as part of the classic era for Universal Studios Florida. By highlighting elements of production, it still fit organically into the theme of the park and would close in 2000. The building would sit abandoned until 2004, when it hosted a Halloween Horror Nights house. It would later be condemned by the Orange County Health Department in 2005. Eventually, the building was demolished in 2011, making way for Transformers The Ride in 2013. Other small attractions at Production Central would include the MCA Recording Studio, a small interactive exhibit that opened with the park and allowed guests to experiment with sound effects in film. Later, it would be replaced with Stage 54 in 1997, and worked as an area used to showcase props from upcoming Universal films such as The Lost World, Jurassic Park, and the 1999 reboot of The Mummy. This one then closed in 2003, becoming Donkey's Photo Finish, a meet and greet that still exists today, even with the closure of Shrek 4D. To wrap up in Production Central and get onto the more exciting attractions, an outdoor soundstage located adjacent to the Murder, She Wrote Mystery Theater would host the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, which opened in 1992 and was based on the cartoon of the same name. Finally, this was replaced the following year with Star Tunes, another outdoor theater show that I cannot find any footage of, but featured classic Hanna-Barbera characters, then closing in 1996 and being moved to Kid Zone as a meet and greet until 2008. The next area of the park is New York, designed as a functional studio set when needed and historically hosting some of Universal's best attractions. The anchor e-ticket for this area was Confrontation, an attraction designed as an expanded version of the King Kong Encounter from the Universal Hollywood Tram Tour. The facade of the building was designed to emulate Pennsylvania Station, a railroad hub for New York City built in 1910. As you enter the building, a news broadcast plays out over the speakers and televisions throughout the queue, relating that New York City is under attack by King Kong, and that authorities are doing everything they can to evacuate residents and take down the monster. The lobby area then transitions into a New York subway station that's located right under the platform for the Roosevelt Island Tramway. Interesting details throughout the queue include advertisements like you would see in a subway station, and pretty extensive graffiti. As you reach the ramps to go up and board the tramway, you can look out into the city streets of the 1970s and see some surprisingly detailed facades that reveal a level of commitment to immersing riders into the environment. I can't speak enough about how great this is, because there's elements out there that most people would miss but are still present regardless, acting as a true testament to how ambitious this early park really was. Moving up the ramps, the guests then reach the station, where they will board the tram suspended from the ceiling, each featuring a tram driver who would deliver exposition and help sell the ride experience. As the tram moves out to evacuate riders from the city, you can look down over the incredibly detailed city streets. As the tram turns a corner, the driver exclaims that it looks like they're entering a war zone, and riders can see a building on fire to their right. 
Authorities then come in over the tram's intercom, warning the driver that Kong is moving towards them and that they should stop the tram immediately. The driver frantically replies that the tram is stuck in automatic, it won't stop, and suddenly points on something happening on the left side of the tram. A helicopter spotlight shines onto a building, revealing the shadow of Kong as he's just around the corner. As the tram continues forward, riders can look down and see the destruction caused by the monster, as a sparking utility pole begins to fall. Other elements include a destroyed fire hydrant, an overturned ambulance, and a derailed subway car bursting into flames. As the tram rounds the corner, another sparking utility pole is seen, and riders can hear Kong roaring as a silhouette appears on the bridge. As the tram approaches, searchlights simulate helicopters arriving as the tram driver yells that they're over 100 feet up, and begs the helicopters not to start shooting. The tram continues moving forward, and the driver screams for everyone to hold on as the giant animatronic figure simulates hitting the tram, having it shake violently. Like with the Hollywood version, being close to Kong gives riders an opportunity to smell banana scent from the figure's breath. Suddenly, Kong takes out a helicopter, as a static prop version on the bridge bursts into flame, revealing the wreckage. The tram manages to just escape, making a right turn into another street. The driver reassures riders that everything is okay, and that they'll be returning to Roosevelt Station, which is just around the corner. Suddenly, Kong's roars are heard again, and the tram is blinded by the searchlight from another helicopter. The driver yells at the pilot to turn the light out, and as they do so, a life-size helicopter is revealed on the left, but another huge Kong animatronic is suddenly revealed on the right. The ride vehicle stops, and the Kong figure moves his hands underneath as the tram rises on the track, simulating him picking everyone up. Now held up to Kong's face, the riders again smell his banana breath as he roars at the tram, and the driver screams for help. The helicopter fires at Kong, causing an explosion behind him, resulting in the tram being let go. It falls and flies forward dangerously, then resuming motion and escaping away from Kong as the helicopter continues to fire. As the driver announces that they've escaped and made it back to the station, a news report appears on the screen, describing the close encounter of the tram riders and Kong, splicing in reaction footage taken of the riders as the tram dropped. While confrontation is largely forgotten today, I still consider it one of the most ambitious attractions ever created. While it suffered serious technical issues throughout its lifespan, the ambitious scope of the ride just can't be matched, especially with its full animated figures. Not only were the fully detailed New York sets impressively designed, but the many show elements like the fog, water, and pyro effects were used to convincingly create a sense of danger. The ride system was also used to help simulate Kong either banging on the roof or picking up the tram, and it just continues to impress me how cleverly these elements were used to make the ride experience feel convincing. Confrontation would close in 2002, and would be replaced by Revenge of the Mummy in 2004. While fundamentally different as an indoor roller coaster featuring many dark ride scenes, Mummy was definitely a worthy replacement, despite how much I wish that Kong was still there. This is the end of part one. In writing the script for this video and really taking a deep dive into classic Universal Studios Florida, I underestimated how long it would take to cover the history of the park and its early era of attractions. Because of this, I've decided to split the video into two parts, and will eventually release a full version as it was intended. I'm excited to really get into part two though, covering attractions like the Ghostbusters Spooktacular, Earthquake, Jaws, and a number of other experiences that defined the early park. From there, I would like to break down why these attractions were demolished and replaced, offering commentary on the current state of the park and reflecting on whether it was a mistake to fundamentally change what was Universal's flagship experience. Again, a lot of time and research goes into making these videos, so if you'd like to support them, it's as easy as just simply hitting the like button. If you want to be alerted to new videos when they're released, I also highly recommend hitting the subscribe button with bell notification as well.